I'm going to start with a quote from Macbeth. This might be paraphrased a bit. So those of you who are into literature, I apologize if I completely mess this up. So in uh, Macbeth, Shakespeare wrote, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under. And there's some T in there, but I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that T. So, you know, within the plant kingdom, look some unfathomable, unfathomable evils. And uh, most of us approach our gardens and plants and we encounter them with a kind of with a kind of naive trust, thinking that everything from nature must be safe. We nibble unfamiliar berries, we brew medicinal tea from unrecognizable bark, assuming it all must be okay. And um, you know, that's all fine, it's lovely. And when we welcome a baby into the world, we rush to add safety caps to electrical points and clips on cupboards, but we don't think about that house plant in the corner or the shrub by the front door, or possibly the very pretty plant in the, in the garden and you can garden for years without suffering the ill effects of a plant but someday the plant kingdom's dark side may make itself known to you so um, this talk isn't designed to scare people away from the outdoors um, it's quite the opposite actually because we all benefit by spending lots of time outdoors and uh, you know plants can nourish us and heal us and um, but they also have the capacity to destroy and uh, some plants have quite a scandalous history. So uh, hemlock killed Socrates, the toxic tree temporarily blinded Captain Cook's crew, the most wicked weed of them all, tobacco, has claimed 90 million lives. And there's a stimulating bush in Colombia and Bolivia that's fueled a global drug war. So plants are absolutely amazing. And uh, if you're entertained or alarmed or enlightened, then I've done my job. I'm just someone fascinated by the natural world and enchanted by the plant kingdom's criminal element. So I'll share their dark little secrets. And they're not just lurking in a remote jungle somewhere far away that we're not going to get to this year or at all. Um, they can be found in your own gardens and streets and parks. So some of the plants I'm showing you today will hopefully be familiar things, things that you would have seen where you're living and while you've been out walking and exploring. Um, you may have come across things that look like this, but I must stress that I'm by no means an expert. Um, I dip in my toe in an area that fascinates me. So I'm just sharing a few things that I've discovered that I hope you'll find of interest too. So the potential for tapering nature is staggering. By conservative estimates, some 100,000 animals from lizards and snakes to sea and enemies and jellyfish produce venom, which in turn can contain hundreds of different toxins. But plants are an even richer mine more than 400,000 identified species and many of them toxic to one degree or another. Fixed in place, plants are especially adept at producing chemical defenses against insects, larger plant eaters, and even other plants. A process that allow, has allowed plants to flourish for about 450 million years on the land. So other familiar plant toxins are caffeine and nicotine, both plant-based products well-known pleasurable effects on the body, but taken to excess, they reveal their essentially poisonous nature. So I'm going to just start the display. That's a little introduction there. Let me just share my screen. So hopefully you can all see that. I shall start from the current slide. Hopefully you can see that. So there's some white briny there. You eat that, that will give you diarrhea member of the cucumber family. There is some of it growing in the cemetery park. You'll find it um, growing amongst the wild roses and briar on the southern side of the cemetery park near the railway line that we call um, Scrapyard Meadow. And there is a small patch that grows near the stone centre, the white building near the Southern Grove entrance. There's some growing along the graves there behind the war memorial. So why are they poisonous? Well, plants need to protect themselves against different threats. Like I said earlier, these could be insects, herbivores, and microorganisms, bacteria and fungus. So all different parts of the plant can be toxic. There's the roots, the tuber, the stem, the fruits, the buds and the foliage. And they can be present in numerous types um, of plants. And these are when they're ingested in, few, in, in food as large quantities or not cooked properly, that's when it leads to food poisoning. That's what I'm just mentioning. And uh, so they can enter the body also by inhalation swallowing or by touching okay and but some some and some plants the poisonous constituents they occur throughout the whole plant 
and uh, or they can be or they can be present in kind of one or more plants so it depends and the doses of these substances are the most important factor when it comes to poisoning all right so there's a little bit there let me go to the next slide so before i talk about types of plant toxins um let's just think about poison as a medicine you know i've kind of been a bit alarmist to start off with and i'm not trying to scare everyone off the of the um of plants and think that they're all out to get us and that kind of stuff. But, you know, the word poison does invoke thoughts of murder, mayhem. But for centuries, healers and scientists have harnessed the power of natural toxins and venoms. You has been found, we'll talk about you later on, to be effective in the treatment of breast, lung and other cancers, as well as AIDS-related carbosis sarcoma. It has also been found useful in the preventing a renarrowing of coronary arteries stent recipients. So the drug is a prime example of a use of poisons in the service of medicine when thinking about you. A challenge to the modern view of poison as an instrument of death, whether by accident, suicide or murder most foul. Of course nature's poisons have been used for medicinal purposes for millennia. Small doses of opium, mandrake, henbane and hemlock numbed the pain of surgery for more than a thousand years. So there we go, lots of, and there's, there's so much new stuff being done um, with regards to plant toxins and their benefits um, for medicine and other uses. So on this slide here, we have a picture of a gorse bush. If you were, have been in the cemetery park and you know the Charles Francis monument, it's a tall obelisk and with, you can see the top half of a door with a cross in it that's been kind of stamped out in circles. There's a gorse bush right near this. And, most of last week and in all through this hot little flurry we've had those seed pods have been exploded i like to call it shotgun bush because when you're next to it they can be quite violent and they they pop and they scatter their seeds all over the place so um it is an absolutely fascinating thing i actually had someone come and ask me about this this morning i was uh, getting tools out to start at work and someone went there's this plant and it's popping and so i said to them what i just told you but anyway, that's a brief aside. We're talking about types of plant toxins. So I'll put a few on there. Um, I'm by no means a biochemist, so uh, I apologise to any biochemists in the group who um, have criticisms of my understanding of what these different compounds are that can be found in plants um, that are, you know, part of, that are produced as part of their, their photosynthesis to defend them, but also to help with their kind of biomechanical processes. And uh, so kind of some of the top ones are alkaloids. So these are organic compounds containing nitrogen uh, derived from amino acids, which uh, kind of make up proteins. And um, most of these, when found in plants, they produce kind of strong psychological activities. And then we've got glycosides. And these are compounds formed from simple sugars with another compound. Uh, many drugs and poisons are derived from plant glycosides. Such uh, you've got cardiac glycosides, such as um, digitoxin from foxglove. And these, when in plants, can cause vomiting, confusion, changes in colour perception, cardiac arrhythmias, and uh, are kind of some of the dominant symptoms. And then you have tannins. Now, most people wouldn't think of tannins as a, a toxin. You know, we have tannins in tea, and they are a, a kind of class of astringent. But, you know, consumed in quantities, they, they do have side effects. They can cause stomach irritation, nausea, vomiting, and liver damage. Um, and uh, yeah, and they, they even can cause increased chances of developing nose and throat cancer. But you know, tannins, most people are familiar with tannins when it comes to um, treating leather. And then we have proteins. So these are macromolecules formed by amino acids. So these are the smaller molecules, so they're large size molecules. And uh, these, there are hundreds of thousands of amino acids that are attached to each other to make long chains, form a protein. And then we have oxalates, and these are the juice or sap of crystals. And you find, you, know, well, you see some of these in plants I'll talk about later. And so these are needle shaped crystals. They can irritate the skin, the mouth, the tongue, and the throat. They result in throat swelling, breathing difficulties, burning pain, and stomach upset. And, uh, I forgot to mention an example of a protein. A protein that most people will be aware of uh, is uh, ricin from the castor plant. You know, people sending that in the post. There we go. So there's a, there's a protein, you know. So let's move on to talking about some of our plants. Ivy, a poisonous plant. 
Well, there we go. So I thought, let's start, let's start simple. We're gonna, we're gonna start really low and we're gonna build up to kind of the, the, top, the top ones that you're likely to see um, around the cemetery park and your wanderings in Tower Hamlet. So we're gonna find lots of ivy around where we go. And most people wouldn't think of ivy as a toxic plant, but the berries are very bitter. And uh, if you were to eat them, they'd give you intestinal problems, delirium and respiratory problems. And we've had this where we've removed so much ivy from the cemetery park as part of our woodland development. Um, you know, I remember those early days, and I'm starting to think in late 05, 06, 07, when we were tearing out shed loads of this stuff. You know, we'd get people coming to us with skin, skin irritation because the sap from the leaves can cause irritation and blisters. So there we go. There's ivy. Something to be mindful of. So nice little one there. And I, we might get someone going, do we have poison ivy or poison oak? No, they're North American plants. We don't have them and it doesn't cause the same problems. We often get that question from uh, North Americans when they come volunteer in the cemetery park. And here we go. Here's a familiar one, nettles. So um, I've got a nice close up picture of the underside of the leaf there. And you can see all those wonderful hairs that are called trichomes. And these are small hairs that act like hypodermic needles, um, which inject their payload of venom under the skin when you brush the leaves. And these are all over, um, upper and lower leaf, the stalk, the stem, and absolutely covered in them. And uh, one of the components of the, uh, the, the kind of chemicals in, in the actual hollow hairs there is formic acid, which is found in the things of bees and wasps. Um, but so, some of the actual uh, toxins within the, the stinging nettle still haven't been identified by science, but most of us have been stung by stinging nettle. You know, we get that mild irritation and um, swelling and redness and uh, can last a day, but often not. But I always feel quite grateful that we don't live in Australia where there's a stinging nettle tree and that stinging nettle tree has the capacity to still sting you when it's dead on the ground. And when you've been stung by it, it could, you could still feel the effects of that sting up to two years after the incident. In Java, there's a stinging nettle um, that can cause lockjaw and in severe cases, death. So I'm like, half an hour, day, boo-hoo, whatever, it's fine. And you know, stinging nettles are great food plant as well, not just for wildlife, but for humans. You can eat the leaves raw and they're great for caterp uh, the caterpillars of butterflies like peacock. And um, I think almost 100 different species of invertebrate live all or part of their life on a nettle. So it is a really valuable plant. Um, but some people might have heard that it helps with alleviating the symptoms of arthritis. This has been recently tested and proven to not help at all. So there we go. Science, great stuff, isn't it? So there's stinging nettles. Bracken. Here we go. This is a single stem fern and it is one of a few plants that is native to every continent on the planet and uh, most people might have heard of this as a known carcinogen people worrying about when it's producing spores so under, underneath the leaf you get these small structures i think they're called sorry and uh, they release the spores when the plant is reproducing and so um, in places in britain where they manage bracken um, the, the site management team have to wear face masks to filter out that pollen um, because it is a known carcinogen. The whole plant is. Um, and if you were to crush it, it has a distinctive almond smell. It really is quite nice. And if you were to squeeze the stem and release the sap, you have to be really careful. Any of you have pulled out bracken to cover a den, or if you've helped in the park and you've not worn gloves, if you're not got your wits about you, it can give you a nasty finger cut. Um, but yeah, squeeze the stem out by squeezing the stem and you can get the sap out. It's a good soap. Um, but in places like Japan, USA and Canada, the uncurled fronds, so the, the very young bracken when it first emerges from the ground, they're called fiddleheads. And uh, in Japan, USA and Canada, these are considered a delicacy and eaten by a number of different people. And uh, where they eat the fiddleheads, they have high incidences of throat and stomach tumours. So enjoy it and be amazed that this plant is native. I've done them. Um, when I've done tours with people of Bangladeshi heritage, they all recognize this plant. It's amazing. They're like, I know that plant. I know that plant. And so it's really nice that, you know, uh, people who, you know, uh, new, new, new communities to the country, they can find familiarity in plants. Mm -hmm. 
stinking iris roast beef plant um any of you have been on a walk with me i often tear a bit of this leaf off and get people to smell it because it does distinctly smell like roast beef sunday dinner um not everyone finds it smells like that but lots of people do and most people are kind of repulsed by it and like, it's horrible um but yes all parts of this plant are absolutely poisonous um especially the rhizomes the root structures underground those pods in there they will open and um, when ripe and expose bright orange berries so when children used to be kicked out and told to come home when the street lights turned on you know they'd see these lovely orange berries and pop them in their mouths and uh, eating any part of the plant will cause uh, will irritate the stomach and the intestines cause vomiting and diarrhea um, but yes the sap can also irritate the skin and cause blistering so yeah stinking iris it did look really striking a few weeks ago when the flowers were out they come in kind of purples and yellows it is a cracking little plant and you'll see it all over the cemetery park at the moment elder so the queen of summer drinks um very popular with people and they do go out hunting for it but it it is poisonous it's more dangerous when consumed raw but most parts of the elder contain varying levels of cyanide um, which can cause uh, severe nausea and vomiting that you do recover from it so you know when you when you are using this plant it's always best to cook with it or you know especially if you're collecting the flower heads to fritter them or to make elderflower champagne or syrups or cordials really just soak them strain them or pick those flower heads off you know it is it, it is something to be very mindful of i have experienced people frittering the flower heads and uh, just yeah you know it's elder it's lovely i'm just going to eat the whole frittered flower head and then vomiting they felt fine afterwards but you know while well, you're vomiting you're like why am i vomiting it, it's quite upsetting and disconcerting but yeah do be careful with holly with them um, elder and holly i managed to find one ripe holly berry you can see the green ones on there but i was wandering around trying to get a nice picture of holly that had kind of the distinctive leaves and the berries i was like oh there's one with a red berry that's very distinctive that's very holly um so hollies are separately gendered this will be the female and um, you have male and female plants so we generally think of things that make babies as female so the holly so first it's prickly and there's a kind of one kind of dangerous thing about the plant but if you were to eat the berries around 20 of them they contain a, a, a toxin called illicin um, which is a very bitter alkaloid and uh, if you eat them they can cause vomiting diarrhea and drowsiness so in in lot in lots of plants in the animal kingdom you know we also find red orange and black colored berries attractive but many of these things are also attractive to birds which are the primary dispersal agent for a lot of these fruits so you know it's not there for us and these are red to attract birds to eat them and uh, you know pass them through their stomach and poop them out and spread a holly tree hopefully somewhere else with some compost So this is Russian comfrey, but talking about comfrey more general. Now, lots of people eat comfrey. They love it. We've done um, comfrey leaf fritters on our wild food walks, and they go down an absolute storm, sweet or savoury. So either salt and pepper or some powdered sugar or icing sugar. You know, they really are really, really nice. But, you know, there is more research being done on comfrey. It is um, being discovered that it is more of a, problem for long-term eating so it is it is a known wound healer so it is a mild astringent it can help slow bleeding and it's useful in helping with minor wounds it's been known as um, nip bone to help with you know kind of keep things straight and stiff as you know as a kind of plaster when you get your broken bone but if continuous high dosing of eating this plant can cause liver tumors most of them benign but it can do that so it's an alkaloid and the research has discovered that if you are to eat this plant, please go for the older leaves. Older leaves tend to be safer. They have um, lower quantities of the alkaloids that can cause these um, mostly benign liver tumours. So continue to enjoy comfrey, but don't put it on a pedestal. You know, I say that about all nature. Don't put nature on a pedestal. Put it on a pedestal for marvelling at it and being in awe of it, but not as you know the cure and wondrous thing we think it's going to make us feel better it's natural it must be good and sharks are natural they're not they're not always good when we're in their come when we're in their territory so there we go 
Flushing Humphrey. Bud's foot truffle. Here we go. Love, fabulous, lovely pea family plant. And uh, you'll see this all on the southern side of the cemetery park, going in our grasslands. And uh, the leaves are the most poisonous plant part of the plant, but all parts of it are poisonous. It contains hydrogen cyanide. So in excess, this will cause respiratory failure and even death. So um, there we go. Such a beautiful little plant, often called eggs and bacon, because the, uh, the, young, the young flower buds, when they appear, uh, look, like, look red. So they look like the bacon and the open flowers are the egg. And um, yeah, such a lovely little thing that you wouldn't even think that it can uh, be so harmful to our health. Let's put that on. Laburnum. So we have one of these outside the Sony Centre, our white building by the main gates on Southern Grove. And look at those tempting pods. Another pea family. A lot of the pea family are quite poisonous. They're not all, you know, so many of them you just don't even want to touch, you know, or you can just eat the flowers and nothing else. But this plant is entirely toxic and uh, it's widely found in gardens and parks. Um, but over the years, many have been cut down because it's suffered from kind of widespread hysteria due to its uh, poisoning effects. So most of the poisoning instances are found in children who mistake those very attractive seeds in their pods for peas. You know, again, probably when children were more aware of these things, you know, they, they would have seen that and thought they were peas in the pod. And they'd go grab them and bust open those pods and start munching. And uh, it can be quite fatal um, on eating. You'll immediately, your mouth and throat will burn. And uh, continuous consumption will cause headaches, nausea, vomiting, frothing at the mouth, convulsions, and possibly even death through paralysis. If you were just like, oh, I'm going to love this burning sensation. I'm going to still eat it because it must be a lovely garden pea. Um, so enjoy it as it is. I think they're an absolutely fabulous plant. If you're walking in the cemetery park and coming through the Southern Grove Gate, you know, a month or so ago, this would have been uh, uh, covered, absolutely festooned with um, yellow pea-like flowers. And uh, it's often called golden rain. Um, it's less obvious when it's like this, but even the other week, uh, my colleague Dim, who's the education manager at the cemetery park, we had some children with their dad and they were picking these and opening them. We had to give them a warning because, you know, getting it on your fingers and then putting your hands to your mouth and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's an alkaloid, alkaloid called a cytistine or cispistine, something like that. I'm not very good at speaking with these kind of, I do try to learn them and then I forget how to pronounce them. So, and you will find this all around, so laburnum. Next, we have lords and ladies, and this is how you will find it in the cemetery park at the moment. Um, you may not have even noticed the lovely um, hooded flower that was even around two weeks ago in some places in the cemetery park. Looks like the, the cow the, on the Oast House, that lovely, or like a monk's hood. But they're really low to the ground. Um, they, ha they, they have this lovely spadex, this lovely yellow rod that appears out the middle of the plant, and it's not attractive. Um, due to its visual um, appealing um, nature to insects, it's for its smell, because it smells of fecal matter. And so it attracts insects that are involved in the decomposition of poop, um, which are drawn in down into the flower. The bristles kind of go down. Insects get trapped for a day, engaged in pollination. Bristles recede. Insect leaves, goes and does, does, goes and does it in another plant. And then that's what appears. So that brown structure. Um, is the remains of the hood of the flower um, that's kind of wilting away. And this is what those insects were unwitting participants to, um, involved in the pollination of this plant to produce these berries. Now they're green and maybe not so attractive when they're green, but they will turn a fabulous orange. And uh, this is when they can become attractive to the absent minded passerby. Ooh, orange must be fine because. Lots of people do apply general rules to nature and think if it's like this or like that, it must be okay. Can't do that. Just get to know it, get to learn it, get a book, discover for yourself, don't make assumptions. Um, but if you were to eat any of these berries, you would get intense swelling of the tongue, internal inflammation, and it could even result in death after several days of a convulsive illness. So not too nice. And alongside that, you'll suffer with severe diarrhea and an irregular heartbeat. So you just feel quite rubbish. 
But in Elizabethan times, they used to dig up the tuba, so the, the plant of the part of the plant under the ground, and they used to use it to stiffen their roughs. Um, but they did abandon it due to the irritation. And these are the things that have these oxalates in it, these kind of crystals. And this is what causes the irritation and uh, the convulsive illness and the burning sensation um, when, you, when you eat one. And I, I did do a wild, I think Terry was telling me actually, he did a wild food walk once. And the leaves of this plant, they look like massive sorrel leaves. And there was a woman on the walk and she came running up to Terry and she goes, I picked this leaf. And I thought it was sorrel and my mouth is burning. And, you know, she had just made a Miss ID, you know, not really looked at the plant properly, just saw the shape was sorrel-like, you know, with long point with a couple of towels coming down on either side of the stem. And uh, yeah, ended up, thankfully not drastic, but she was complaining of a burning sensation in her mouth. So yeah, don't eat berries if you don't know what they are. Lords and ladies. And you. Here we go, a highly toxic tree, a slow growing evergreen um, that can live for several centuries, being associated with lots of folklore and myth around kind of immortality and rebirth, as this tree has kind of been permanently in landscapes that people were associated with. But every part of this point, plant is extremely poisonous, except the flesh of the fruit. So if you look at the photo I took there, you can see kind of the, the, the outer light light green part of the plant um, that's the that's the kind of berry developing but eventually that dark green section will turn red and it'll be jelly like and that tastes like something between a strawberry and a raspberry but inside that it's like a cup there's a hard black nut in there and that will just induce vomiting so um, if you are going to eat you berries you you know just be really careful don't just follow the, the seed that's in the red jelly like part but yes it's all poisonous so eating the seeds the leaves they'll cause stomach problems dangerous drop in pulse rate possible heart failure um, and one medicinal manual mournfully noted that many victims never described their symptoms because they were found dead and in a vet medicine in a vet medicine journal they wrote often the first evidence of you poisoning was unexpected death so um, it is really really quite toxic and um but it has potent anti-tumor properties as i described earlier so you know for quite a number of years people have really been using this plant to help fight cancer tumors so um you know it's not all bad it's, um, we can take some positives from these things next we have foxglove uh, deadly nice deadly plant look at those lovely flowers with those spots that look like an ulcerated throat, hence the name throat wort. And accidental poisoning, often it comes from mistaking it for comfrey, okay? But all parts of the plant can irritate the skin. It can cause severe stomach upset, delirium, tremors, convulsions, headaches, and fatal heart problems if ingested. So, you know, some alongside is there some other symptoms you'll get from poisoning are kind of hallucinations. You'll get this rapid pulse, a low blood pressure, dizziness, vomiting, diarrhea, collapsing, death. There we go. But it is used to prepare the heart drug digitalis, which stimulates the muscle, so it increases muscle tone, raises the blood pressure, and strengthens the pumping action as well so you know but if you are on digitalis you're very closely monitored by the gp or you know consultant that's, uh, that's giving that to you because too much can go the other way but yeah that was uh mo most of the fox lives in the cemetery park have kind of gone to seed that was the only one i could find with a flower on i wish i'd uh, kind of thought about take, getting a flow photo a few weeks ago but anyway found that one we do have a few we do have the odd white one that pops up as well um, not one, you know, these are just genetic variants, but traditionally they're pink. So there we go. Lovely, lovely foxglove. Very deadly. And would you like to see the antidote for foxglove poisoning? That's the next one. Look at that. Deadly nightshade. That is the antidote for foxglove poisoning. And we do have one in the cemetery park. It's not the easiest plant to find. You have to go off piste a bit. Um, it, was in, it is within the fence there of the cemetery park and very close to the graves that we call the Charterhouse graves, which are these distinctive 
pointy graves that make up our, our logo. Um, you'll find a big bush there. And uh, it's a pretty fabulous looking plant. Those lovely dark, um, you know, and like flowers, which will eventually turn into like paint and leather blackberries. They're, they're, they're really, really shiny. And I did read a story once of an old woman who used to collect these very attractive shiny blackberries every autumn and turn them into a pie. She thought they were a type of blackberry or, or something, and she didn't really know what they were. But she was very lucky. She never actually died from it. But um, yeah, she was making a pie, but she'd get ill all the time. And so once her, pair, her family started to investigate what was going on, they were like, are you eating anything? And she was like, I ate this pie, and I get them and feel a bit sick. And you know, they discovered she was um, poisoning herself with deadly nightshade. Um, but yes. A little, little bit of, let's go back a step anyway. So there was a, plant, a professor and plant researcher called Henry G. Walters, and uh, he declared that plants were capable of love and had memories. And he implied they might also hold a grudge as lovers do. And so he believed that deadly nightshade was filled with hatred, okay? Because the entire plant is poisonous, rubbing against it can even cause pustules. And uh, it performs its dark magic with the help of an alkaloid called atropine, which will cause a rapid heart rate, confusion, hallucinations, seizures, and symptoms are so unpleasant that atropine is often added to additive as in an uh, to addictive painkillers to prevent addiction, um, which is quite interesting. Um, and in the 16th century, Italian women used to make mild tinctures of this plant to add to the eye to dilate the pupil because it was believed to make them more beautiful making them more alluring and, and their eyes were sparkling their eyes were sparkling so they must be more alluring um, so that's how it also got its other name belladonna beautiful woman okay but atropine eye drops are still used today um, to dilate pupil, uh, patients pupils to give a good view of the retina during an eye exam and uh, a long time ago, early physicians used to make a, a, a potent brew of this as a surgical, a surgical anesthetic. And, oh, I always, I always struggle with that word. Anyway, you know what I mean. You know, when they put you, you know, numb the pain when you're having surgery, I'm going to struggle with that. But also medical students use a lovely mnemonics trick to help them recognize the signs of poisoning. So it goes hot as a hair, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, red as a beet, and mad as a hatter. So, um, you know, that's a nice thing to remember if you're ever worried whether anyone's suffered from um, any kind of poisoning, whether it be plant or something else. So there we go. So that's Deadly Nightshade. I'm really, I think this plant's absolutely fabulous. It stands, uh, the one we've got in the centre of the park is almost six foot tall with multiple stems that are all splayed out like a fountain. And uh, yeah, it certainly gets nibbled by things. There are certainly animals that eat the leaves. But um, I, I do love the berries. It is a fantastic plant. I keep talking about that. But that is my final plant. It was kind of a whirlwind through um, kind of toxic plants and what you, and trying to think of things that people might see where they walk. I could have gone into lots of other things um, that, that that are more more kind of peculiar to the cemetery part that aren't widely found found widely across the town hamlets. So I may have put a few in here. But um, there we go. So. Thank you very much for listening. I do hope you learned something interesting. Mm -hmm.